Now on BBC One, slightly later than scheduled, The Sky at Night with Patrick Moore. Good evening. I must, F here, begin with a, a very sad announcement. The death of Professor Sir William McRae, one of our leading astronomers, and who, with Roger Taylor, built up the astronomy department at Sussex University. He made many contributions. The world has lost a great astronomer, and many people, including me, have lost a very dear friend. The International Space Station is now going over, and here's a Douglas Arnold photograph um, of the trail. It's quite bright, and we'll be seeing a great deal of the ISS in the years to come. You know, now and then, we think it's rather a good idea to pause and have a general look round the sky. And this seems a rather good time to do it. And there's so much you can see, even with the naked eye. But of course, a good idea to get some optical aid. And the best thing to do in my view is to start off by using binoculars. And here's a pair of binoculars. These are 7 by 50 binoculars, and these have a, a magnification of 7, and each objective um, 50 millimeters across. And that's a good general pair, a wide enough field to be useful, and uh, enough power. If you go above a magnification of about 12, they become rather heavy to hold, so I'd go between 7 and 10 or something like that. And believe me, binoculars are far better than a very small telescope. That's my 3-inch refractor, I had when I was a boy, long, long ago. And in my view, that is about the smallest telescope that's much real good for astronomy. You can buy out, go out and buy much smaller telescopes and have about as steady a blamanges. And frankly, I'd rather go for monoculars. Also, one more thing, you know. One thing you must never do, never turn a telescope or binoculars toward the sun. If you do, you will burn your eyes out, and that has happened. There's one golden rule for looking at the sun through a telescope, don't, even with a dark filter. And I'll say more about that later when we come to talk about the forthcoming solar eclipse. Well, as I say, there's a great deal to be seen, even with the naked eye. And, well, what about the moon? <laughs> the moon, our faithful satellite, naked eye shows you plenty of features there. Those dark areas are known as seas, but they're not seas. There's no water there, and there's no air either. We still use the old names. Up to the left there, you see a large starch patch, and that's the so-called ocean of storms, an old lava plain, and here's a photograph of it taken by Commander Hatfield, a typical piece of lunar scenery. As I'm sure you know, the moon shines only by reflected sunlight, has no light of its own, and therefore the, what we call the terminator, or sunrise line, sweeps right across the moon once every 29 and a half days, beginning first of all with the crescent moon, and the dark part there is lit up by earth shine, then as the phase increase, the earth shine goes, Note, by the way, the craters on the sunrise line, I they show their shadows, they're best seen. Half, three quarters, again, the kind of ocean of storm coming into view now. Then at full moon, the sunlight's coming straight down, you don't see the shadows, and then everything is repeated uh, in reverse order until you get a new moon. And note also, those shadows are sharp and clear-cut. Reason for that, the moon has no atmosphere. And well, here's a view from Apollo 15, the astronauts are actually there. You see the black sky. Uh, very sharp shadows, and if you screen your eyes from the glare of the rocks, you see there uh, the stars and the earth and the sun all shining down from a totally black sky. And uh, just in passing, if you go to the moon, the gravity is weak, you have only one sixth of your earth weight. What a jolly good idea. Um, I mentioned craters. Here's one, the large 120 mile Grimaldi, another Hatfield photograph. You see there that large plane toward the edge, and there are no craters like that upon the earth. And certainly, the moon's a wonderful sight. Even binoculars show you a great deal. And with a telescope, the joys of the moon are endless. But let's turn now to the stars and begin, as we so often do, with Ursa Major, the great bear or the plough, which is, never sets over here, and therefore you can always see it whenever the sky is dark and clear. And the seven famous stars, I think, are well known. Those two, Merak and Dupe, are known as the pointers, where they show the way to the pole star. And you'll see straight away, they are not the same color. Merak is white, dupe quite clearly orange. And that means the dupe 
has a cooler surface temperature than Nellac, but the comet of that is larger, also more powerful. Dupe could equal 60 suns, Nellac only 24. But Dupe is further away. One light year is equal to nearly six million million miles. Dupe is 75 light years away, Nellac only 62. As you can see there, they are not really connected at all. Dupe is in the background. The stars in any particular constellation are not genuinely associated. We are dealing with only line of sight effects. But there are double stars, and one of these is found in the Great Bear. Look at Mizar, the second star in the bear's tail. Close beside it is a smaller star called Alcor, and they make up a genuine pair. Telescopically, they're shown like that. The star in between is not a member of the group, it's in the background. And here's a Hubble picture of Mizar. A lovely view, because those rings are purely photographic effects. In the Ursa Major, the ancients saw the outline of a bear. Well, I think to me that takes a good deal of imagination. <laughs> there it is, there's the bear for you. But um, probably rather easier to find out the outline of Leo the lion, and we can do that. Use the pointer to the pole star in the opposite direction, away from Polaris, and you'll come somewhere near Leo, with a curved line of stars marking the sickle, and there, the bright star Regulus. But you can see Leo, right? But not always. Unlike the bear, Leo is not always above the horizon, it's not circumpolar, and it does set. Let me show you what I mean. Here are the stars of the far north. There are the pole American Dupe, and they show the way to Polaris, the pole star, very close to the pole of the sky. Therefore, Polaris appears to say almost still, with everything else going around it, once in 24 hours. And as they do so, the bear stays above the horizon, but Leo does not. Leo dips below the horizon, and there are times when you can't see it. It is not circumpolar. And another star that's not circumpolar is Arcturus. Come back to the bear, follow around the tail, and you'll come to a very bright orange star, Arcturus in Buerti the Herdsman, actually the brightest star in the northern hemisphere of the sky, a lovely light orange star. Well, Buerti itself, the Herdsman, rather a formless constellation, frankly. But near it is an interesting one, Corona Borealis, the northern crown, with one fairly bright star called Alpheca. Now, use binoculars, look at the crown, and normally, inside the bowl, you will see two stars, one to the left, one to the right. The one to the right is an ordinary star. The left-hand one is a very interesting star indeed, called R. Coroni, and that is a variable star. Most stars shine steadily, R. Coroni doesn't. Normally, it's on the fringe of naked eye visibility, and we're not going to show it well. But sometimes it fades down, becomes very dim indeed, and we know why. It's very remote, very luminous, and periodically it throws out clouds of soot. And that soot accumulates in the atmosphere, and R. Coroni hides itself between a sooty veil. And that stays until it's blown away, and the soot blown away, and R. Coroni returns to normal. So, if you look at Corona, and see only one star of the binoculars, you know that Arcaroni is hiding herself behind a sooty veil. Shall we now go back to the bear, or to Arcturus, and further still we come to the bright white star Spica in Virgo the Virgin. Actually, two stars, very close together, they appear to us as one. And Virgo's a large constellation, rather Y-shaped, and one very interesting star there is called Arich. And there is Arich. The naked eye appears as a perfectly ordinary star. Actually, it is double, made up of two twins, identical stars, going around their common central gravity once in about 170 years, rather like the two bells of a dumbbell going around their adjoining bar. Now, when I was a boy, long, long ago now, it was a very wide, easy double, easily simple with that telescope. Not so easy now. They're closed up, and that's the view we have today. Not because the two stars are really closer together, but because we are seeing them from a less favorable angle. And by the year 2016, they'll appear so close that no ordinary telescope will split them. After that, they'll open out again. They say, again, a pure line of sight effect, and that's Erich. But the entire area now of that area, part of the sky is dominated by the presence of the red planet Mars, far brighter than any star, a world smaller than we are, further away from the sun, and of surpassing interest to us. And you can't mistake Mars because of its brightness, also because of its color. And uh, here's a photograph of it.
taken by Douglas Arnold with his very fine telescope. And there you see the red disks, the dark areas, and the red deserts. A few nights ago, I looked at Mars with my own 15-inch reflector, and uh, I made this sketch. And that sketch, in fact, um, shows Mars, I hope clearly there. There it is. See the polar cap at the bottom, and those dark areas, and the red areas there. And we call those deserts, and they are, but they're not sandy. They're dust deserts, and Mars is a rusty kind of place. And, of course, Mars also is a very cold kind of world. Any life there? Well, no little green men, no plants. There may be a certain amount of primitive life, and we are now trying to find out. One thing, Mars doesn't twinkle very much. Stars twinkle because they are virtually point sources, and their light comes to us through the Earth's dirty, unsteady atmosphere, and is shaken about. And the stars are high up, twinkle less than stars low down. You see, the, the low down star, the light comes to us through a denser layer of atmosphere, and therefore it twinkles more. But a planet does appear as a small disk. Here's a Hubble picture of Mars. Well, you can see they've been there. Now let's go further away, reduce Mars in size, and then even though Mars now appears as a tiny disk, it is still a disk and not a point source. Therefore, the twinkles over the parts of that tiny disk cancel out and the planet doesn't twinkle nearly so much as a star. Well now, back to the stars themselves. What about the Summer Triangle? There are three bright stars, Deneb in Cygnus the Swan, Vega in Lyra the Lyre, and Altair in Aquila the Eagle. And you know, that nickname, the Summer Triangle, is completely unofficial. Given by me in a Sky at Night program over 40 years ago now, it just caught on and everyone used it. It is unofficial, and those three stars are not connected, and they're again different distances. Altair just over 16 light years away, Vega 27, and Deneb over 1,500. And Deneb's a real searchlight, equal to 70,000 suns put together. Cygnus itself is often called the Northern Cross. It really is quite X-like in shape. And the faintest star on the cross is called Albario. And that is a lovely double star, a colored double with a golden yellow primary and a vivid blue companion. Good binoculars show it, and with that three-inch telescope, it's very well seen indeed. I think the loveliest double in the sky. And here's a, a poor, dirty impression of what you might see if you lived on a planet going around Albario. Whether that is a planet there, of course, I don't know. But certainly, do have a look at Albario. It's a lovely sight. The brightest star of the Sun of the Triangle is Vega, almost overhead now, and bluish in color. Can't mistake Vega. And we know Vega is one of those stars associated with cool, possibly planet-forming material. And this poor dirty impression shows you what a Vega may be like. And we know that's there, but I wonder, are there planets there? I'm not saying there are, I'm saying there may be. And there are other stars like that with similar shells. Lyra itself is an interesting group. Close to Vega is a faint star called Epsilon Lyra, there it is. And if you've got keen eyes, you may make out it's double, two stars. And telescopically, those are again double. And I made that drawing with this three-inch telescope, and they uh, have two pairs of stars there, and they make up a really a complicated, rather family group. Epsilon Lyra is a double-double or quadruple star. Also in Lyra, something very different. Near Vega, two ordinary stars called Beta and Gamma Lyrae, and between them, a thing called M57, a planetary nebula. And here it is, telescopic view, neither a planet nor a nebula. I may say, people say they can see it with binoculars. I can't, but you can with a telescope. And here's a Hubble picture, the Hubble Space Telescope, and an interesting thing. In fact, it really is an old star that has thrown away its outer layers and those are now dissipating in space. A star far more evolved than our sun, and in um, three or four thousand million years from now, our sun will become temporarily a planetary nebula, and quite a number of these things are known, so have a look for M57. Between Arcturus between and Vega is the constellation of Hercules. Well, Hercules, uh, in mythology, was a great hero. In the sky, Hercules is, frankly, rather dim. I think it deserves something better, but there is one very interesting thing there, a globular cluster, Messier 13. You can see it dimly with the naked eye, but not going to show it. And here's a lovely Douglas Arnold picture of it. And you see a huge symmetrical system of stars, 22,000 light years away. And I wonder, 
in the middle of that cluster, the stars are much closer together than they are in our part of the universe. And uh, suppose we live on a planet going around a star inside that cluster. What would the night sky be like? Well, Brown Smallwood drew this impression, and it could well be so. There may be no true darkness at all. And many of those stars would be red, because globular clusters are very old things. So if you can, have a look at Messier 13. But one thing I have not mentioned so far, and that is the brilliant planet Venus, now visible in the southwest after dark. So bright you can't mistake it, looking almost like a small lamp. Actually, it's close to the twins, cast on Pollux and Gemini, but when you see Venus, the sky may be too light to show the twins. Venus, remember, a world just about the same size as our Earth, closer to the sun than we are, and a strange kind of place. Here's a Douglas Arnold picture of it, and you can't see very much there, and neither can you on this sketch I made a little while ago with my own telescope. And in fact, the surface is permanently hidden by a layer of dense, unbreathable cloud, and Venus, not really, a very nice kind of place. In fact, the surface temperature there is something like 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, so lovely though it is, Venus is not a place to visit. You'll see it now, it'll remain on view for all the summer, and become a gradually narrowing crescent. One more thing, go outside on a nice summer night with a glass of wine, sit down, look up at the sky. You may see meteors or shooting stars. A shooting star is merely a tiny particle dashing into the Earth's air and burning away. And you can see these meteors at any time. Here's a picture of a Perseid meteor taken by Terry Mosley. That's true, across the picture. Why the Perseids? Well, the meteors of Shah radiate from one particular point in the sky, and the August meteors come from the constellation Perseus. And the radiance near the star Gamma Persei. Begins late July, goes on till the second week in August, and any time then, you should see a good number of Perseid meteors. And the shower maximum is on August 11th. And that, of course, is the time of a new moon, the time of our total solar eclipse, the first one in England since 1927. And here's a picture of the 1998 eclipse taken by Chris Sturgeon from the Caribbean, the moon in the middle, surrounded by the sun's lovely corona. And believe me, it is a marvelous sight. But again, please be careful. When the sun is totally eclipsed, then by all means look straight with the telescope. At any other time, don't. And the dangers are very real. Well, to see totality, either South Devon or Cornwall, and there are places left in Cornwall, I'm told, and the Cornish Tourist Board has given us a number, 01872-322-900, and they will give you information about that. So let's only hope there are four clear skies. If you're holidaying in Europe, well, the track does cross Europe, and therefore if you go there, you might also see the eclipse. And if we miss this one in the West Country, don't worry, do another one in September 2090. And you may want to photograph the eclipse. And when I come in next month, I'll be joined by Douglas Arnold, giving instructions upon how to do it and obtain a permanent record. And of course, we do have our Sky at Night website now, www.bbc.co.uk forward slash sky at night forward slash. We also have our Sky at Night information line, 0891-8030, and uh, our CFAX number, uh, page 620. So we'll give you all the information from there. So let's hope for clear skies on August 11th, and next month we'll explain just how to photograph this marvelous total eclipse. So until then, good night.